1997 saw the release of the Nintendo 64 in Europe. Uh, the fuck? This is my original machine from Christmas of that year, still going strong. You don't need me to tell you that the N64 was an amazing console. Don't call it the fun machine for nothing. Featuring such classics as Superman 64, Chopper Attack, and Power Rangers Lightspeed Rescue. Captain, there's something heading our way extremely fast. It's coming straight at us. I've never seen anything like it before. Action. Racing. Fun. Adventure. Nintendo 64, the fastest, most powerful games console on Earth, now at 99.99. But it wasn't all action, racing, fun and adventure. There was always something holding the console back. Did you notice the thing that they didn't show you in that advert? The elephant in the room. That controller. Sure, at the time we thought it was revolutionary. Well, now we know better. There have been improvements and innovations made over the years, the Hori Mini here being one of the best. But when it came down to it, it always ended up with my sausage of a thumb having to make feather-like movements on a joystick not much bigger than a nipple and pity my girlfriends, but that's never something that I've had a deft touch for. There has to be a better way. And so I set out to find it. I wasn't going to be happy with anything less than the pinnacle of video game control. And when it comes to video game control, there's a clear winner. The mighty keyboard and the rock steady mouse. There was only one problem. I didn't have a clue where to even start with trying to hook a keyboard and mouse to an N64, let alone make the two things communicate. I had a lot of googling to do. Okay, I'll not take you on that excruciating journey and just sum up what I found. It turns out there's quite a lot of information out there about how the console and the controller function, and if you brush away some of the jargon, it's pretty simple. In brief, the console sends short signals a couple of bytes long to the controller. These can be requests regarding the controller pack status, load and save commands, a reset command, or it could be polling the controller for its button inputs and analog stick values. At this point, I only care about that last one. When the controller is polled in this way, it responds with four bytes. A byte in this case is a set of eight binary digits, where each can only have the values of zero or one. The controller conveys these bits as pulses of high and low voltage along the data line to the console. When the controller wants to transmit a zero, it sends three microseconds of low voltage and one microsecond of high voltage, a microsecond being a millionth of a second. And when it wants to transmit a one, then it's one microsecond of low voltage and three microseconds of high voltage. The way these four bytes, 32 bits, can give the status of the controller inputs is also pretty simple to understand. For the first two bytes of 16 bits, 14 of those bits just describe the state of buttons. One if they're pressed, and zero otherwise. The second two bytes describe the position of the analog stick, one for the horizontal axis and one for the vertical axis. So Nintendo's dirty little secret is that this so-called analog stick was digital all along, with only 255 possible positions in each direction. They just thought you'd be too stupid to notice. All I had to do was find a way of encoding keyboard and mouse inputs into strings of electrical oscillations a million times a second and get them into the N64 console. Somehow. I'd seen people do some impressive things with Raspberry Pis and Arduinos, so I thought that this was probably a good way to go. And so, I set about trying to understand the finer points of controlling microprocessors. Turns out the blunt end gets you a pretty long way too, and before too long, I was seeing results. 
If I could make a light flash rhythmically, I was probably ready to write code that would control an N64, right? Uh -huh. Well, not quite yet. First, I needed to connect all these bits of technology together. The microcontrollers I used in this project were the Elegoo Uno, TeenCLC, and TeenC 4.0. The Teensies were the ones that did most of the heavy lifting, and my prototype design incorporates either Teensy. And these two versions, they can be used interchangeably because they have the same footprint and identical pinouts in the case of this project. Just soldering some legs onto them and putting a socket onto a prototyping board meant I could swap the microcontrollers out at will. I picked up an N64 controller extension cable to sacrifice to the project, I didn't want it flapping about loose, so I drilled a couple of small holes through the plastic, threaded through some garbing wire, and soldered it in place, and that seems to hold it very solidly. Then all I had to do was connect the three lines, power, ground, and data, to the appropriate bits of the socket, and bingo! PC via USB to N64 via microcontroller. Now, this whole project could be completed by simply soldering the three wires directly onto the microcontroller board. Hell, it could be done by wrapping the bare wires through the right holes and blue tacking it all in place, but I wouldn't recommend that. I did it this way because I was stumbling about in the dark and wanted my setup to be as flexible as possible just for testing purposes. But with this setup, I was confident enough that I could make a microcontroller pin go from high to low voltage and back in a controlled manner. I'm going to save you from another excruciating journey and just show you how it turned out. What I'm trying to do here is to listen out for the status command and respond with an electronic handshake. What I ended up doing was giving the console a stroke. Not exactly a successful demonstration of the hours I put into this, I was going to have to rethink my approach. So I did what every good programmer does. I went online and found working code from someone who actually knows what they're doing, and I used that. A big shout out to James Reed, whose article, linked below, set me on the right path. The code I found for the microcontroller came with a Python program to run on the PC that illustrated how to send signals to the microcontroller through a USB port. I'll provide the GitHub link for all of this down below. It was time to write a program that would take my keyboard and mouse inputs and send them in real time to the microcontroller, and my work here would be done. It's never that easy, is it? I figured if Python was good enough for the proof of concept, it was good enough for the real thing. So my next step was learning a bit of Python. It's a pretty forgiving language, and before long I had something that looked like it might do the job. This is where I should point out that I decided to use the game Turok 3 Shadow of Oblivion as my testbed game, so looking around with the mouse and keyboard inputs for everything else. It also meant that I was writing this code with a quite specific control layout in mind, so it was pretty limited with what it could be useful for, but it would be a good starting point. I put in the game, programmed the microcontroller with the code I found online, started the Python code I'd written myself, booted up Turok 3, and this is what happened. <coughs> Clearly, something was going wrong. <coughs> but at the same time, it was also kind of working. My inputs were recognised, and the game was responding to those inputs. I'm just not sure what my inputs were doing in the three seconds from me slapping the keyboard to the N64 noticing that I'd done that. It was time to start troubleshooting. Oh, no! Run antivirus. Give me a systems display! I'm a programmer, so naturally, my first instinct was to blame this shit new programming language that couldn't even perform the simplest of tasks without dragging its heels. I mean, it had to be that. So I booted up Unity, because it's familiar and it already understands a whole bunch of PC inputs, and I rewrote my code. By the time I was ready to test it, I was pretty confident that this code would be spitting bytes at that serial port at such a high volume it wouldn't even need a loop. So I set everything up, turned on the machine, and... Yeah, I'm sorry Python, all is forgiven. 
but I was going to stick with Unity for the rest of this project, because by this point I'd had the idea of building a nice looking user interface to dynamically redefine the keys and to select ports, and I knew how to do that in Unity. I mean, maybe I had to do something about that delay first, but once that was sorted out... User interface. Narrowing down what was going on here was definitely a time-intensive and confusing process. I eventually tried a better microcontroller on the off chance that there was some kind of bottleneck there. I went from 16 megahertz to 600 megahertz of raw processing power. Bafflingly, using the microcontroller that was nearly 40 times faster did this. Wait for it, wait for it. <laughs> it doesn't feel faster, does it? If anything, it feels dramatically slower. And, after extensive experimentation, it turns out that yes, this much faster microcontroller is actually a lot slower at executing this particular code. But don't be fooled, this was a good thing. It's another data point that let me narrow down exactly what was going wrong. You see, whilst the better microcontroller was a faster processor, it also had more memory, and I think it's here where my problem lay, in the memory. Or more precisely, how the code I found online was queuing up data to pass on to the N64. You see, the console polls the controller for its inputs about a hundred times a second. So if I'm giving inputs to the microcontroller any faster than that, then the untransmitted inputs are buffered into memory until the memory's filled up. But I think in order not to lose any inputs, the code I was using was always passing on the earliest data it had in the memory. Like adding to the top of a pile and taking from the bottom. What I wanted to do was make sure the console was being given data from the top of the pile, or even better, bypass the pile altogether and only pass on data coming directly from the USB cable. And this is the thing with using somebody else's code. My own might be a spaghettified mess, but it's a spaghettified mess of my own creation. I know what the strands are doing. Other people's code? Well, let's just say reverse engineering code is a skill that's a lot harder than it might seem. The solution? After far too long, I eventually arrived at this boolean value. Stop this boolean value from ever being false, and the bottleneck goes away. I think it means that the incoming data won't have to queue in any buffer, but even if I'm totally wrong, this boolean was the key. I stripped it out of the code, plugged everything in, and... It felt a little bit unreal, but there I was anyway, playing Turok 3 on an original N64 with a mouse and a keyboard. Okay, granted, given how mouse movement has to translate to an analog stick position, that needed a lot more polish, but it worked. I was pretty chuffed. I'm just, I'm just, 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 just. And here we are today. Mouse control could still use some tweaking, but it's a great improvement to how it was. My gaming experience hasn't been better, and yours could be too, for just three simple payments of, well, nothing, because I linked to my program down below in the description, it has an installer, and it's bundled up with all the tweak code for the microcontroller and some useful instructions. It's been fully tested on my machine, and it seems fine, but user experience may vary. I'd love it if people wanted to copy this project. If you give it a go, do let me know how it works out in the comments. I've condensed this whole thing down, but from start to finish it's been about six months of trying to figure it all out, and I never expected it to boil down to such an accessible solution that anybody could try. So, I don't know, follow your dreams or something? Don't forget to like this video if you did. Uh, this isn't really what my channel is normally about though, so don't worry about subscribing, you'll not be missing out on more cutting-edge technology integration marvels. But thanks for watching. I hope it's inspired you.